Well, I'm uh, deeply honored to uh, have been invited to give this, and it's really a great pleasure to, to be here. I have a lot to say, so I'm going to get right down to business and uh, tell you about isogeometric analysis. I, I realize that some of you already know about it and are even working in the field, but uh, it's something that I started, oh, well, maybe the idea was about 10 years ago that we started to instantiate it. The first paper came out in uh, the end of 2005, and it's really grown quite remarkably, I must say. Uh, it's had a big effect, and uh, we've talked about citations, and it's, uh, it's exponentiating in, in citations right now. Well, let me tell you uh, about this problem. I think uh, if you have followed my career at all, you know I've been concerned with engineering analysis for the greater part of it. But the truth is, my first job right out of uh, undergraduate school uh, was uh, a design job. I was a, a mechanical design engineer. So I do know a little bit about design. I actually designed things that were built and flew in airplanes uh, way back when. It was a different business at that time. It was a non-computer business. You worked with drawing boards and calculations were done essentially by hand. Uh, they were done with desk calculators, but not uh, sophisticated computers. Well, times have changed. Now you have uh, design technologies that are encapsulated in CAD systems, and you have analysis technologies that are encapsulated in finite element programs and uh, finite volume programs. And uh, of course, the process of uh, design and analysis are integrated in product development. The product development cycle is, a, is an iteration between these activities. It's a constant flow of uh, design speaking to analysis and analysis speaking to designs. Uh, these days, uh, things are very, very complicated. These are some of the more complicated things that are, that are built commonly. Uh, and you can see if you get into uh, submarines and uh, warships, you're in uh, situations where you have millions of parts that uh, are all captured by design systems. There's a file somewhere for the design of every one of the parts. They all have to be analyzed, and that process is a process of, let's say, translation from the CAD representation of geometries to the finite element representation, finite volume representations. Um, what has occurred over the years is this process of translation has gotten better, but it now occupies a considerable amount of time, so much so that it's the dominant cost in the overall analysis design process. So I like to look at diagrams like this. It's quite common. You can talk to people in major firms everywhere. And usually the, the development of computational models from analysis takes about 80% or more overall analysis time. This is really a pity because you'd like a fully integrated approach. Uh, if you had that, you could possibly uh, reduce the time and the cost of uh, analysis uh, a great deal. Um, and you probably do a lot more analysis and improve the designs thereby. Well, this is a, an anatomy from Sandia Laboratories, and they found exactly the same thing. Most of the uh, time goes to creating the analysis files. I'm going to talk about the approximations that are involved in that. Uh, finite element representations, the discrete methods, are very, very crude representations of geometry. In some problem classes, like flows or aerodynamic shapes, that can be quite problematic. Uh, but isogeometric analysis is sort of a, an attempt to solve this problem of product development, to try to better integrate analysis and design. So I'll give you a little bit of an outline. I'll tell you a little bit about isogeometric analysis. I'll begin with a tutorial and some of the ingredients for the people that are new to it. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about vibrations and eigenvalue problems because I think this is where we get insights into approximation theory that really tell us that uh, perhaps these new, new, new techniques actually have tremendous merit as computational mechanics technologies. I'll show just a sampling of some examples of solids, including structure interaction. But then I'll return to this problem of design and how the technologies that are actually used in engineering design are deficient in that area. So isogeometric analysis not only tries to change analysis to suit design, but it endeavors to uh, change design to suit analysis. 
So this is the challenge. Now, fortunately, people in computational geometry have joined the fray. Uh, they are quite interested in this as well. So I'll talk about uh, NURBS and some of their deficiencies, and then uh, T-splines and a couple of applications. So isogeometric analysis uh, is based on technologies that are common in computational geometry. That's where we find the technologies for design, in particular engineering design, but the design of just about everything. Everything you make these days is a, is a <coughs> uh, CAD design file. Uh, the technologies are essentially the same as used in animation, graphic art, and visualization. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that technology and try to use that as a new basis for analysis, but simultaneously, without sort of throwing anything away, modify them both to be better for both design and analysis and integrated at the same time. So if we do this, we can recapture finite element analysis, but we have many other possibilities. Very precise and efficient geometric modeling, simplified mesh refinement schemes, the ability to develop very simple, smooth basis functions with compact support to solve higher order differential operator problems that are really a problem with classical finite element technology. Um, I, I will argue superior approximation properties and try to show you some examples of that. But the key is to solve this big problem of the integration of design and analysis, and that's what we're working on. It's not a simple thing, but it's, uh, it's the goal of isogeometric analysis. So let me begin with a tutorial. These blinds are sort of the progenitors of all of the technology in, uh, that are used in engineering design. Uh, they're typically designed, uh, they're defined on, uh, in one dimensional space and then iterated in a tensor product fashion. So you, def you define them recursively. You start with piecewise constants over so-called not intervals or elements, and then you order elevate uh, with this cox de Boer recursion relationship to get linears from the constants, quadratics from the linears, and so forth. If you do something very simple, like to subdivide uh, a so-called patch uh, in equal subintervals, you can generate the constants, the linears, which are familiar from finite element analysis, and the quadratics. But the quadratics are different. They're smooth, and you can see the trend. You're getting smoother and smoother. These are C1 continuous. They're always pointwise positive. It gives them the stability that classical finite element functions, Lagrange polynomials, for example, do not have. That's crucial for design and has benefits in analysis. What you typically work with in practice is uh, non-uniform, uh, not vectors, that are open. And that means the multiplicity of knots at the end is p plus 1. That gives you an interpolation property at the end, and it allows you to assemble patches together in a C0 fashion, at least. If you repeat knots in the interior, you lower continuity. These are quadratics that naturally C1 continuous. You repeat a knot, it drops to C0. You repeat a knot again, you split the patch in two. You completely discontinuous. And you can use that to do certain things like splitting meshes up crack propagation and other types of problems. So this is how you create a geometric object. You take those basis functions, you multiply each basis function by, say, coordinates in the plane, and you create this curve. These are the coordinates. They're not interpolated, as you can see. They're only interpolated at points, these exceptional points where you have the C0 continuity. Uh, this is a designer view. This is the control polygon. You tug on the Control points, you change the shape. And you'll do that in monotone fashion. This is the finite element point of view. You take the images of the knot spans on the geometric object, and you'd like to process things in an element by element fashion over these elements. So we call these Bezier elements. And what I'll show you later is uh, some slides that <coughs> there's really an isomorphism between these points of view. And in fact, the second point of view can be uh, used to implement these techniques in finite element code in a very, very non-disruptive fashion. So this is very nice. Uh, the geometry point of view is very different here, as you can see. It's more global. Now you can refine by just inserting more knots. You redefine the control points, and the, the beautiful thing here is you have refined the mesh, say for analysis purposes, but you have retained the geometry and the parameterization of the original uh, geometric object. 
So if you import the CAD description, which you will consider exact, the refinement pr uh, process preserves it. So you really have the geometry in the analysis package, unlike fine lines, where you have to search for the geometry. And so on, you can make it finer and finer. You can start all over, you can do P refinement. You can order elevate the functions by the recursion relationships. Here we've kept the continuity at C1, but we have cubics. So we had to repeat internal dots. So we have exactly the same geometrical object. Now we just have the initial mesh, but we have more and higher order functions defined on it. And likewise, go make the coordinates and so on. Now, nerves are just the ratios of these blocks, non-uniform rational of these blocks. And this is the basic technology that's used in engineering design. And the reason for that is you can create preform shapes like the curve that we just showed, but you can also create very, very precise engineering shapes like circles and all conic sections can be created exactly. And uh, that ratio of these spines, sort of pictorially depicted, is really a projective transformation. And what we have here is one of the constructs when you take four <laughs> quadratic arcs, you project into the plane and you create an explicitly represented exact circle. There are other ways of doing this, but you can make all conic sections just from simple polynomials projected into the plane. So that's the power, essentially, of nerves, and that's why they're commonly used in engineering. It's a precise circle that's not an approximate circle. So you can make uh, a toroidal surface, by sort of iterating this, as you can see. There's the mesh, you can refine it as before. H refinement, element refinement. You can keep the mesh the same, but keep adding more and more control points and higher order functions by order elevation. And if you go to three dimensional objects, this is an eight element, uh, eight quadratic element pipe elbow. And it's exactly circular arcs over there. So that's something that you can't really do very well in kind of elements. Now, <clears throat> how does it work as a computational mechanics technology? Well, if you look at sort of the refinement process and look at the basic approximation properties of nerves, what you would find in Sobolev norms is that you get, in essence, an approximation result that is the same as for finite elements. The underlying polynomials that you use to create the nerves are giving you the exponent of h, the mesh parameter, and that's giving you the convergence rate as you shrink the parameter h. Now, I, I have identified the constant here as sort of a, a Pandora's box. It's kind of swept under the rug to a large extent in finite element analysis, but we'll see that it's really quite different for nerves than for classical finite elements. So it really is a function of the smoothness, and that's sort of a new ingredient here when you go to this type of technology. What does that, what does that error estimate say? Well, if you do a classical problem, say, in elasticity, that has an exact solution, elastic plate with a circular hole, and you create nice meshes, and these are nerves meshes, the circular hole is exact. Uh, you are <coughs> obviously uniformly refining here. Uh, you would converge, first of all, to the stress, concentration, uh, the stress concentration, which is a factor of three, pulling the sheet at infinity with uniform stress. Amplified by three right there. And the convergence rate in the H1 norm or the L2 norm of stress, which is equivalent, would be for quadratic polynomial elements or nerves that are based on quadratics two, when you went to cubics three, and or X4. That's exactly what you get. You would get that with finite elements, and you would get that with the nerves. And this is the result for the nerves. That is sort of what finite element people would expect to see. So you might say, well, these things must be equivalent in some sense. Well, in some sense they are, but in some sense they're very different. And this picture illustrates that. What you have here is eight data points, and we've interpolated them with Lagrange polynomials of increasingly higher order, three, five, and seven. And you can see they oscillate, and as you go to higher order, the oscillations become more violent. If these were to represent sort of a a step, this continuous function, if you had more and more points, the oscillation amplitude would not decrease. Just the wavelength would change. So you can't get rid of those with interpolatory polynomials. 
Now with nerves, you view these points as control points. And what you get is a monotone fit. They're known to extreme, they have a variation diminishing property. So if I added many more points to this sort of step like data set, I can make this as sharp looking as I like, but in fact it would be very, very smooth in detail. That has advantages in some cases. So let's look at vibration problems. Um, it's hard to see, the photographs are not coming out too well, but this is a stiffened cylinder. It was tested by NASA, and it was used actually to correlate against analysis codes. So it looks like an airplane fuselage. So this is a model, a nerves model, a three-dimensional model of everything, this is the interior structure. And it is geometrically exact according to the design drawings. This is the whole structure with the skin. Even the skin is modeled as three-dimensional now. And again, every detail is there according to the design drawings. Every fillet, every hole. This is just some uh, detail of the main rib. This is a, a CAD-like picture. That's the underlying mesh, that coarse mesh. And that allows you to get all of these fillets exactly. It's just sort of the benefit of this type of uh, representation you can get. Uh, you can make a right turn in a very small area without getting too much mesh. And you need that for getting correct stress concentration, of course. So you can refine in place. That's how you refine. You don't change the geometry. Uh, you can compute eigenvalues, mode shapes, as we're seeing here, some of the fundamental modes. Compare with experiment one shot, you get very, very good results. And this is a challenge of modeling when you mix beams and shells for typical finite element analysis. But what I want to get to is really what is going on in eigenvalue problems and what they tell us about the approximation. This is, again, a vibration problem, but a simple model problem, just a uniaxial rod undergoing uh, ax <coughs> axial vibrations. So the natural frequencies of the square root are the eigenvalues, and you can compute eigenvalues <laughs> frequencies with your favorite method, take the ratio, and that's a measure of the error. Uh, everything here is the standard Galerkin method, so nothing more needs to be said about that. Well, if you compute with quadratic finite elements, the classic finite elements, you get a famous picture. It's in my book of 25 years ago. And you get a spectrum that has a bifurcation. There's an exploitation that I won't go into for that. But the upper part essentially has no approximation capability whatsoever. It's sort of part of the folklore or structural analysis that you throw away the high modes in finite element analysis. You don't want to see them. That's easier said than done in some problems because you just don't have access to them. Now you look at the, uh, the result for nerves, which are really yeast blinds in this case, and you see uh, it looks much better. What these are are spectral curves. These are the loci of all of the frequencies, no matter what number of degrees of freedom you use. So they're normalized by the number. So if you had 10,000 degrees of freedom, the 8,000 mode would be here. You'd have a 5% error in that. You'd have maybe a 25% error in the final so it does seem to give you a better spectrum. But it gets very interesting as you go to higher order. As you go to higher order, things are supposed to be converging. Where is that result we saw before somehow embedded in here? Well, it's all down in this part of the spectrum, the lowest modes. You're getting a greater degree of tangency. That's related to the rate of convergence in H of the lowest modes. The interesting thing is you take C0 continuous, finite elements, the upper part of the spectrum, the so-called optical branches, they diverge with P. They're getting worse, and the low modes are getting better simultaneously. You have no approximability here. If you go back to the first finite element mathematics book by Strang and Fitz, there's a discussion of this problem. And Gil Strang in the book says, you throw away these modes. That's what the structural engineers told him. That's not quite true. <laughs> You cannot throw them away in nonlinear problems. You don't have access to them. So it's a problem. If there's a lack of robustness. If the high modes are bad and the nonlinear problem, you get coupling with the low modes, so you don't even see the good data in the low modes. And you get obviously bad conditions. These are linears. They don't have an optical branch. And this is why linear finite elements are used predominantly for very, very hard problems where robustness is but you can see what happens if you go to higher order with nerves. You 
get actually the whole spectrum here converging. And that's what you have to say. And uh, you're getting better and better results. And what you find in this track is you have more robustness as you go to higher order. Well, what's going on? What can we say about eigenvalues? One of the criticisms that was thrown back at me when I showed people this is, well, we're not interested in eigenvalues. We're interested in hydraulic problems or something like that. And, uh, eigenvalues not an issue. Eigenvalues tell you about the errors in your analysis. You can do a spectral analysis of elliptic problems, parabolic problems, hyperbolic problems, and what you will find is that you can represent all the errors in terms of the errors in eigenvalues, and or the L2 norm, in the case when that's the appropriate norm, let's say the mass term, and the energy norm. And only two of those quantities are independent, but all the errors can be expressed in terms of those quantities. They are all related by the one global result in theory for, that joins the errors. That's the Pythagorean eigenvalue error theorem. Everything else in eigenvalue error analysis is asymptotic and it only tells you about the wrong moments. But really, the, the whole picture is the interesting one. So if you look at these different quantities now for, say, quadratic C1 continuous functions, these forms in this case, you see you get something like this. These are the eigenvalues rather than the uh, frequencies as before. They're basically the same picture. This is what you're getting for the L2 norm of the error, and the sum is the energy error. Okay. What do you get for C0 quadratic functions? What we showed before, you had the bifurcation of the eigenvalues were giving you this bad branch, but something crazy happens with the L2 error. You get a big spike right around the bifurcation. If you are looking at things around here, or if you have inputs to your system around here, you will get absolute garbage. And this is the energy error of the sun. Now, elliptic problems are very forgiving. The type of problem we showed before, it, it, you know, elliptic there's the discrete counterpart of that is the eigenvalues act in your favor. They're in the denominator, they kill off a lot of things. Parabolic problems, if you wait long enough, they do the same thing. But hyperbolic problems, any error that is there at any time is there forever, and it propagates all over the place. So these things will tell you that higher order C0 prime element methods are not an ideal technology for hyperbolic problems. And indeed, they're typically not used. If you, go to, if you look at the, uh, this approximation, you might say, well, where's the best approximation property which pervades elliptic theory? This is the eigenvalue problem. You don't necessarily have a best approximation problem. If you look at the best approximation, the smooth functions are essentially giving them to you in the L2 model. This is the best approximation over here. You don't get in the eigenvalue problem. And that's what's creating errors in, in all these things. PDE cases. <clears throat> you go to higher order, this picture gets better. This is cubics. This picture gets worse. You go to higher order still, same phenomenon. The energy error is now off the page. So you really have better approximability with these functions. Now coming back to this constant. Constant is really a, a bad name to call something that is a function of many, many uh, aspects of the problem. There's a way of looking at uh, spaces. It's called the, the Kolmogorov endwidth technique. And you essentially get a sense of how good your n-dimensional space is. And it gives you insight to the constant. The idea is uh, if you want to approximate, say, a function in a big space, maybe L2 is the big space. Uh, this particular function might be a very smooth function, but it's in L2. And you have your favorite finite dimensional, n-dimensional space here. So you, you want to look at the best approximation you can get, the infimum. Now, the idea here, though, is to go a little further. What you're concerned about is the bad guys there. Maybe there's some set of that space, like a class of smooth functions, maybe H2, 3, 5, whatever. There may be some guy there which gives you the worst best approximation. That's the souping over all of the functions, say, in the target space. That gives you some sort of a measure of how bad things can be when you, when you even get the best approximation. Now, if you're a math student, 
you probably encountered in soup, you know all about it. And if you like in soup, and I know a lot of mathematicians do, you're going to love polymer bar variants because it's the in soup, it's even better. So you, you ask the question, what is the n-dimensional space that gives me the minimum worst best approximation? Okay. And that, in some sense, is defining an optimal space. And what you can do is calculate these soup ints for your favorite spaces and compare them, even if you don't know the optimal spaces in the sense of the Commodore vendor. This leads to some rather unusual eigenvalue problems that are actually numerically <coughs> possible to solve. So you can actually evaluate an n-dimensional space in a very, very precise way. And what you find, again, is the smooth functions, in this case here where we're approximating essentially H5 functions in the L2 topology, you basically are converging on the end width as the number of degrees of freedom increase, and you asymptote to some value that's higher for C0 functions. So that ratio is essentially giving you insight to the ratio of the constants. I won't try to explain this uh, this picture because it's too complicated. But uh, the interesting thing that you find when you sort of explore possibilities is that of course smooth functions uh, approximate smooth polynomials, approximate uh, high degree smoothness target functions, rough functions well approximate low smoothness target uh, uh, solutions. And of course, uh, you would know that if you take uh, crude functions, constants, linears, you would not approximate very well smooth functions. That goes without saying. But the amazing thing is, if you have very, very smooth polynomials, you can approximate very rough target functions very well. That was a surprising result. We were led to do this study to show that that wasn't the case. But the conclusion was smooth functions are always good. Now let me show you sort of some robustness uh, results. This is the Kahn-Hillian equation, fourth order in space. This is sort of used for various uh, phase separation type problems. It's just the sort of segregation of binary alloys. I won't take this to the limit, but it goes to, well, maybe I will. It, it goes to a periodic solution. It's a periodic boundary condition. This, the phase is completely separated. And you get monotone solutions with these functions, even with uh, Fullerton methods. There's no artificial diffusion. You get very, very nice solutions. As you go to higher order, you get even better solutions. Higher order and smoother functions, you get even better solutions. So you get robustness and accuracy with these methods that are not typical of the element methods. This is a th just a three dimensional illustration of this uh, segregation. You're actually solving the isoparametric problem in the, the limit, which is mathematically interesting, the known solution in this case. But now you can do it on complicated uh, topologies as well. So you can do things like this. This is the continuity equation on a solid torus. So just, again, some applications. Higher order functions are not used for crash dynamics traditionally. This is a crash simulation S problem. It's the uh, crushing of this box beam. A lot of contact, a lot of plastic deformation. And what you're seeing here is C3 quartz functions with, you know, um, <clears throat> these are not spans, so they're spanning half this uh, uh, face and uh, very robust. This is the first time these problems were solved with high order functions. Again, increased robustness with order. Sliding contact, it's been a bugaboo to find an element analysis because you have all of these facets. Uh, but you can do them very nicely with like, these nerve bit of nerve specializations. It's an irony problem, it's a sort of screwing something around like that. Those are very, very hard problems, but very easy with this technology. FSI problems. I'm not going to go into fluids. There's some amazing new technology coming out of, uh, of this area. Maybe I'll bring that up at the end. But this is an FSI uh, problem with the uh, variational multiscale method for the fluids in the interior, but again, all nerves for everything. And this is a, a cardiovascular application, just going from imaging data to a aortic model, uh, through various steps. This is a nerves interface system for doing arterial analysis. This is a thoracic aorta, studying LVADs, left ventricular assist devices, the kind of things that we uh, implant in people that are waiting for heart transplants. 
And this is just showing what is more or less normal blood flow in the aorta, normal healthy blood flow, versus what happens when you put the anastomosis of the pump uh, in the descending branch like this, which is commonly done in many, uh, many medical centers. You get very, very adverse flow. You get stagnant flow up here. It's, it uh, can really create many, many problems. Let's return to the uh, problems with engineering design based on nerves, the standard. Uh, the major problem is watertight merging of patches. A trim surface is, I don't think it's a problem anymore. I think it's an opportunity for developing technologies. This is a trim patch. You see you have a tensor product and you just introduce via a Boolean operation, say a curve that cuts a hole in it. And here you have various patches that are glued together. Uh, in fact, if you look at that gluing, it's not really watertight. This is illustrated with a teapot. You introduce trim curves, you trim away material, you put it together, and you hide all the problems in the red band, but if you look closely, you have gaps and overlaps. It is mathematically impossible to get them in. So this is a, a problem, and if you would do a stress analysis, of course, a crack could lead to a stress concentration that was spurious, and it can also lead to a, a leaky teapot if you're interested in food. So that's not good. Uh, so nerves have uh, many attributes for analysis, but uh, the water tightness is a main problem. You have to deal with multiple patches, uh, trim patches. Managing them for very, very complex designs is a real headache for designers. So uh, an innovation that came out as a design technology that has real strong analysis implications with cheese blinds, a sort of unstructured nerves type technology that was developed by Tom Cedarberg in 2003. And um, this is a picture of an untrimmed uh, T-spline, going from nerves now to the T-spline. Now you can see it's unstructured. You have what they call extraordinary points here. And you have now a smooth, continuous, single surface T-spline. And this is a little bit of exaggeration. Well, at least the first order, t splines satisfy just about everything you would want in a surface technology, a surface drag technology. So this is sort of an illustration of how you uh, take various nerves patches, you can glue them together, create a watertight design, one single surface. This is a jet ski, by the way. It takes a little while, and you're tugging with the control mesh and playing around. But this is an actual, uh, this is not excerpt, this is the actual uh, screen. And the designer is moving the, uh, uh, the cursor to, to join things together. And when you're all done, you're going to have a, a smooth jet ski design, as we'll see in a moment, I hope. It's much more manageable to deal with this object once, once you have pulled it all together like this. You don't have, if you, you pull on one patch when you don't have water tightness, you just get big gaps. There it is, now you have a smooth design, and you're done. So this is now a very powerful technology. This is from a, a, uh, an airplane designer, Scott Greenewald. There's a video on the web describing the fact that he wanted to do the nerves design of an airplane again. Once he found out about T-splines, you can see you can you know, replicate NAPA profiles very nicely. You can fare into a fuselage using instructions, etc. Now, there's still some issues with extraordinary points that will need to be worked out. But in the typical type t spline package, the design package, these would be piece of cubics. You'd have C1 continuity uh, about the extraordinary points and about these legs. Everywhere else would be C2 natural. You can do local refinement. The algorithms are getting better and better. This is just a ship showing local refinement. Uh, and you have this isomorphism between T-splines or any of really the CAD technologies and the finite element representation. You can pull everything back from the, from the continuous view to the element point of view. You work with Bernstein polynomials. You have an extraction operator that tells you how to put these things back together to form the smooth geometric object. But this allows you to compute just by writing a new shape function, a subroutine in essence, and embed this right in an existing finite element. Um, design through analysis, integrating things together, is working very well already for surfaces with T-splines in particular. 
So this is a bumper design. That's a ner single nerves patch. There's the trim curve. You trimmed it. Now it's a trim nerves, and you can get rid of that because of the unstructured of unstructured this of T-splines. Now it's a T-spline. You're working with the control mesh. This is the design. Finishing the design, working on the control mesh. And when it's all done, this will be a single surface T-spline. And they'll see the Bezier elements. You can output those directly and run those in fine element codes. This was run in LS Dyna. LS Dyna is a commercial code. It's a major code for crash. Now it has uh, capabilities to uh, run nerves and the T-spline files. So this is just the Bezier element stuff. So that's direct, no geometric modifications, no geometry cleanup. You're working directly from the design file in the analysis. Now, of course, the big question that involved is how can we use the design technologies that are getting better directly in analysis? Well, the first thing you could do is boundary elements with the surfaces. You can do that. Uh, you can also use immersed approaches, and I'll show you some of the breakthroughs in that area. And some new geometric methods for building up current models. So with regard to boundary element methods, um, if you have an accurate geometry, it turns out that uh, boundary element methods are, are amazingly accurate. And most boundary element methods are using very simple facet of discretizations, piecewise constants, maybe linears at most. But when you have these high order representations, your crudest mesh will these test problems give you basically exact solution. This is the 3D analog of the plate with the hole. This is a spherical cabinet. The coarsest mesh, you just essentially nail the exact solution in all the stress measures on the surface. So how do you do this for something interesting? You take a design file, a T-spline. This is coming from a real designer. It's a propeller hub assembly. You start off maybe with nerves. You make it a single T-spline surface. That's a single watertight T-spline surface. It's smooth. You use a boundary element code. You can do various boundary value problems, calculate stresses, whatever, get accurate results, no alteration to the design path. So that's one opportunity area that's really coming to fore right now. Another is uh, with immersed methods. The problem with immersed methods is they have always had lack of accuracy at the boundary. Effectively, what this really is, is dealing with trimming in some sense. So this is a solution for trimming as well. And this group picture shows Dominic showing that several people in the group have won awards for their isogeometric work in the, the last year. Dominic is from TUM and spent the better part of the last two years with us. And he continues that he just won the Argyris Award, Alessandro Reality won the Zinkevich Award, and Yuri Bazarus, who was, was a member of the group, has won just about everything in sight. Um, this is the idea. You have something that says complicated geometrically, you put it into a simple mesh, and then you have to deal with that interface. And uh, the work at TUN focused on what they call the finite cell method, in which, in essence, they're not refining the mesh with the functions, they're just refining a mesh here for quadrature, just for quadrature. The functions are defined on the big mesh. Of course, you can do both. And they found improved accuracy that. And uh, work that uh, we've done recently, we show how we can really provably get optimal convergence rates right up to the boundary by doing some, I would say, uh, extensions of those ideas. This is just showing point-wise convergence of surface stresses for the plate to hole problem. So with the immersed method, we now think we can get really accurate results right up to the boundary. So that creates opportunities. We can take things like the propeller, we want to do a three-dimensional analysis. We drop it in a box of these splines, three-dimensional these splines, throw away the ones that don't intersect the propeller, refine the mesh, then refine the quadrature mesh within that existing mesh. This is the fine quadrature mesh. Then you can calculate uh, frequencies, mode shapes. That can all be done automatically. It's very, very simple. The whole model development there is automatic from the T-spline surface. This is a wheel. This is a complicated geometry. It's hard to make a good 3D model mesh of this. This is just the surface T-spline mesh. This is a cornering problem. Drop it in a box of B-splines. Throw away the ones that don't intersect the structure. Refine the mesh locally in the area that you're interested in. Develop the quadrature mesh, which is finer still. 
and you get accurate results, including stress concentrations. So we think this is a powerful thing. If we can make immersed methods work in solids and fluids, we can really have a game changer technology. Because the 3D modeling problem will essentially disappear. But up to now, there have been years and years of work. The accuracy at the boundary has never been higher order. It's been first order at best. But we, we think we have very few technology here. This is some of the things that are coming out of the geometry community using uh, poly cubes. This is just a, a single cube. But uh, instead of a spherical cow, we map a cow to a cube. So if you triangulate the surface, map it to a cube, create a T-spline surface, mm -hmm. Uh, take the, the surface T-splines, propagate them to the interior, you have volumetric T-splines, and then you can map that back to the cow in a smooth way, and you have a nice volumetric mesh. That's a promising technique. This is taking legacy hexahedral meshes and building uh, smooth, solid T-splines. So there are various techniques that are coming about for three-dimensional modeling. Um, the last topic I'm going to talk about is fracture analysis. This is something I think many of you are probably interested in, uh, calculating cracks, and complicated structures, multiple cracks, etc. When you have a few cracks, and especially in 2D, discrete methods work quite well. There's a major crack, there's a secondary crack, and a classical problem. Uh, when you have many cracks, it's hard to track them individually. There are distributed damage models that are typically leading to higher order partial differential equations. That's something that, again, is very well suited to isogeometric analysis because you have high order smoothness. You can discretize these problems, and we've done that. This is actually a sample calculation. But what we'd like to do is, in three dimensions, we'd like to do complicated cracking with the topology of the cracks just sort of arbitrary. It's very, very hard with discrete methods, even the best of them. So the idea is to introduce a phase field approach. And the phase field is just a scalar field that essentially marks the damage. And here it's zero where you have a crack. It smoothly goes from zero to the undamaged material where it's one. Okay, so you're going to introduce the scalar field. And it turns out there is a variational formulation for brittle fracture that essentially has features in common with the Mumford-Shaw uh, approach for image processing. And you have to suitably modify the constitutive theory, separating tensile effects from compressive effects in a invariant way. But this idea went back to Bourdain, Frankfurt, Marigo, Christian Mia is very active in this area, and we're working on things like this now as well. But it leads to a very, very simple, unambiguous set of PDEs that you solve for these problems. This is the basic theory, the second order theory. There are higher order theories that we, we like as well. But uh, that's it. There are no bells, no whistles. You don't decide anything. You solve the PDEs and you solve the crack problem. And what's more, you solve it on the end of one mesh. Now, this is going to be the phase field. All the elements here are just square elements. It's a uniform mesh. You enter the crack by just perturbing the phase field. This is going to be the deformed geometry. It's going to be blown to pieces. But all the calculations are done on the initial mesh. Whoops. Please go back. All right, we pull these apart, crack bifurcates. You get multiple bifurcations because there's so much strain energy and they have tensile energy. Wherever you see it red, it's a lot of tension. It's cracking more. You can see the topology is very complex. All the elements were squares. All the calculations were done in the original mesh, just like what you see here. This is a classic example. It's the Kaltoff experiment. This one actually has a slit in it. You have a compression wave. And the crack propagates off at the same time. And experimentally, with the same data that we used, it's about, just about 65 degrees. Again, no bells, no whistles. You don't tell it which way to go. You just go by solving those two PDEs. And they're easy to solve. The phase field equation is basically a Helmholtz equation with two positive operators. It's really easy to solve. You can solve it with conjugate gradients. You can do the whole thing explicitly. Going to three dimensions is trivial here. It is exactly the same thing. When everybody, when anybody tells you the generalization of the three dimensions is trivial, it's usually a complete lie. But in this case, it's the truth. <laughs> I okay. This is a three-dimensional pressure vessel. This is the 
minor model of the surface, you thicken it up, you the nerves through the thickness, it's three-dimensional. This is the final mesh. We use adaptive refinement here, but all the, the, no, nothing is ripped apart. This is just refinement within the original geometry. This is 3D, maybe you can see that. You're pressurizing it, the crack starts to propagate. You have tensile and compressive waves going around the circumference. That's why you get the stop, stop, stop phenomenon. And the next one I'll show you really is a three-dimensional object. It has seeds of weakness. You just pull on it. Very complicated topology of interacting cracks in 3D. And believe me, that's just as easy to calculate, although it's more expensive, of course, than in a 2D calculation. If you try to do that with, uh, with the discrete methods, you would have a lot of problems. So this is a powerful technology. Now, one of the things, the, the direction this is going in right now, these higher elementals that are smooth do lead to higher expense. Quadrature is more expensive. And in addition, uh, you get, you don't get an increased bandwidth if you get a more dense population within the band. So one of the things, a uh, question comes up, why do we use the Galerkin method? The Galerkin method is ideally, ideally suited for functions that are subspaces of H1, the C0 functions. Really the C0 functions that I think that have driven the Galerkin method to be the, the canonical method for classical finite elements. But when you have smooth basis functions, you don't need to take the derivatives and throw them on the weighted function. You can put them on the solution. So you can work with the strong form of the residual and just do collocation. So you can develop variational formulations based on collocation. And there's some great opportunities there. First of all, you can get higher order space and time accurate methods. They are efficient in the sense that there is always one quadrature point per control point, no matter what the order of the, the basis. And the interesting thing is they're stable, they're not out of noise. All of the explicit dynamics and finite element analysis has been so far uh, really done with the lowest order elements with one point quadrature and have the, the hourglass mode problem. Here you have all of these attributes that never before have been uh, available to the entire element analysis. So this is a very, very fast method. And we're looking now at collocation as a fast, implicit method as well, because you get better band profile structure. So this looks very, very exciting. A lot of people are also working on solvers right now, efficient solvers for systems that compromise the geometric analysis. So as a computation mechanics technology, it's really coming along. As a design technology with T-spawns, it's having an impact. There was a, uh, a computational design uh, conference, a cyan conference, last uh, October, a year ago. Uh, in Florida, and this was the computational geometry community. And about a third of the papers at the conference were on isometric analysis. So they have really embraced this challenge of developing uh, uh, new technologies that are suitable for both analysis and design. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for my book. It's absolutely the best book in the world on isometric analysis. <laughs> it's, the, it's also the only book in the world on isometric analysis. But there will be another one. Uh, guy named Jia Lu has uh, written a book and it will be out pretty soon and more, more recently. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's a, a place to get started, but in fact it came out three years ago just about and it's already completely obsolete. So we're going to be working on a, a new version of this, this kind of year. There are many areas of interest. I didn't mention some of these things. You can get rid of locations and shells because your, your basis functions are smooth. There's some exciting things going on. In, Shell analysis because of that. Uh, interesting new developments in quadrature and close collocation. Uh, shape and topology optimization. Many people are working on that because you're working in the language of the design file. So that translation of going back and forth, that challenge is to, uh, to a large degree eliminated. Uh, I, I should mention there are now bases, uh, smooth spline bases that are. Uh, subspaces of H div and H curl, you can know, add these nice things. You have uh, functions that are capable of pointwise incompressibility. Uh, at the same time, you can uh, discretize the uh, Laplace operator or the viscous stress operator in fluid mechanics. So you have discrete subspaces of H1, but you get pointwise incompressibility, absolutely strong compressibility. Uh, incompressibility. You get all of the right functional relationships 
in fluid mechanics, all of the geometric structure preserving relationships, like uh, the growth of helicity and entropy, et cetera. So these things have not been available to us really here before in quite a long time. So it's, and it's new basis functions. So these are exciting developments in that regime. Uh, modeling is the key. Breaking down those barriers through this sort of synthesis of dreaming up new and appropriate analysis technologies associated with the CAD technologies. Uh, there are some very exciting pathways there as well. So to finish, I will show you a slide. This is a, a mobile slide that's not in my own. Stephanie gave me this. She's teaching a course on isogeometric analysis, which she would like to sign everybody up in the, that's in the room right now for the students in that class. So I'll just leave that up there in case you're interested. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>
So we're not using, I, I would say, the kind of collocation ideas that might be simple-minded and be trying to impose excessive smoothness where it doesn't exist. We respect that um, variational combination. It, I mean, you have to. It's you have to get that on there. You know, one way you, you take the weak form, you assume you have a smooth everything, and then you generate the collocation by uh, assuming the test functions are delta sequences. There's, well, the, the challenge is to really understand these things better now because it's never been investigated this way. But if you have a material interface, you build that into the variational formulation from the, from the, the get-go. Okay, do we have more questions? Um, I think I can do with that. Um, when, when, you were, um, when you were talking uh, on 3D problems, 3D analysis, you briefly mentioned that you could, of course, use trivariate nurse patches, and then you kind of skipped that. Is there a problem with it, or...? Do you just want to avoid the 3D meshing? It's, it's building the models. I mean, I, I did show you some absolute 3D nerves models. I mean, that uh, ATC stiffened cylinder was, those were all three-dimensional nerves. Uh, uh, several of the problems were three-dimensional nerves or three-dimensional piece blocks. Uh, th there's nothing wrong with that, but with, you know, if you want to solve the modeling problem, you have to have a pathway from a surface CAD file to a solid trivariate representation. And you would like that pathway to be <coughs> automatic. That's the classic problem. <coughs> and that's not an easy problem to solve. But I, I you know, I think, I, I'm, I would say, cautiously optimistic that the new immersed technology may be a, a solution for a lot of things. There are a lot of things where you have to build a trivariate model. It's, it's not going to go away. Nothing's going to go away, but you may be able to take a whole slew of problems and make them very, very easy to build good models. I think there was a question in the spline into, say, a box of these splines or some other uniform type mesh or something like that. You, uh, you, have, you do have a precise definition of the geometry. You have to know what the geometry is. Okay. Assume it's coming from CAD as we did. But you're not, uh, what you're computing on are the B splines. You're computing on, let's say, this uniform mesh of the trivariates. So that's where the computation is being done. Now, where, where are the changes? The changes are in the variational formulation. You have to have something that is in there that represents that surface in the least blocks. So typically what we're doing is we're using sort of like DG technology on the surface. It's, uh, it's like a Nietzsche type boundary conditions on the surface. But the key thing is to have a precise representation of the geometry. And then in those cut cells, to have precise integration rules that accurately reflect that geometry. If you do that, you can get optimal rates of convergence as you go to higher order, you get exponential rates, you seem to be able to get all of these good properties. But if you always staircase it, at some point it's going to be first order for the easy problems, and it's going to be worse for the hard problems. That's, so the, the challenge is to really prove that you really can get the accuracy. Because for years and years, that's been the, the drawback. Uh, my question was, uh, is it possible to lower the analysis time, or is the analysis time still comparable to traditional binary method with isotropic analysis? I think with collocation, it's possible to lower it. Um, 
this is a topological answer rather than I, I don't know what the fact is. I mean, everything is problem dependent. But uh, I think, according to, we've got extensive operation counts. We have a, a major paper that we're putting finishing touches on right now. Things are cheaper with collocation approach than with the lurking and C0 finite elements. Typically, they will be more expensive for uh, isogeometric with the lurking. So that's the higher order. But then there's potential to be cheaper and better and do things that we haven't done before. Keep in mind, if you can get rid of that 80% problem, you, you could even absorb some extra cost on the analysis with the computer data. Like, so 